Okay, we'll go and get started. Appreciate everyone joining us uh, this afternoon. Uh, we're going to go over today the upcoming five forms that are going to be changing as of March 20th. Uh, we've been working with the forms providers to get those uh, on their platform. So uh, there won't be anything that you'll need to do on your end. Uh, if there's any interruption to that March 20th date, we will be sure to let you know, but we're we're absolutely shooting for uh, March the 20th. Uh, if you have any questions today, again, as Nick mentioned, I, I encourage you to put it in the group uh, or in the Q&A. Uh, I'm going to, one of the forms we're going to be discussing today is an agency form. So I'd be remiss if I did not advise you, please do not ask about particular business models, uh, particular percentages. Uh, we're going to kind of talk about this and remember that it's a group setting and we're not going to try to uh, interfere or violate any of that antitrust stuff. Uh, for those of you who are watching this at a later date, anything you hear on this today uh, is of a general legal advice nature. So if you have more specific questions, I encourage you to give us a call on the hotline. Uh, that's 803-772-5206 or email any member of the SER legal team. Uh, my email, if you have any follow-up questions after today, uh, is austin, A-U-S-T-I-N, at screaltors.org. So being mindful of everyone's time, we'll go ahead and jump into the first of the forms changes, which is the buyer agency agreement. This is form uh, 130. So the only change that was made to this form is on paragraph five. I'm going to let you know for the duration of this webinar, uh, anything that you see in red writing is existing verbiage that was already in the agreement. Uh, we just moved it to a different place. Anything that's highlighted in yellow is brand new verbiage. So the first thing you'll notice on here under brokerage fee is we no longer have two options. So under our current form and until the change, you have two options. You have option one, uh, which more closely resembles what we will have with this change, and then option two. You know, option two is the option that says if I can't get paid out of the transaction, buyer does not owe uh, any, any fees. So how would you explain this option to your buyers? Uh, the buyer is going to pay the, bro the broker, their buyer's broker, a set fee, either as a dollar amount or a percentage. Uh, and that's going to happen for any property, including uh, FISBO properties. Now, the buyer, now the, you as the broker are going to make your best efforts to try to get paid out of the transaction, have someone else, you know, have the seller side uh, pay that compensation, the seller side, the, the listing brokers pay that compensation. Any amount that they will pay is going to be credited against that fee. Um, but if ultimately if they cannot, uh, that buyer is going to be responsible uh, for that fee for the remainder or uh, all that fee. Now, in the event that what is offered in the, the co-op uh, is a higher amount than what is put in this agreement, uh, that will become your new uh, compensation unless that is agreed otherwise by the party. So unless you and the buyer uh, alter your agreement in paragraph 17 to say otherwise, uh, that will be your new amount. But I would caution you under Article 6 of our Code of Ethics, uh, anytime you're getting compensation, you have an obligation uh, to explain that to your client and have your client consent. Uh, so your client needs to be aware of this. You need to have that discussion with them. That discussion needs to be well in advance of the closing statement. Do not allow the closing statement to be when you, have, you have an obligation uh, to explain that to your client and have your client consent. So uh, once you're, and like I said, any change that's going to be done here. So for an example here, we're going to go ahead and say that your bro your brokerage fee uh, is 5X. Uh, and so your buyer has said, agent, I'm will, you know, buyer's broker, I'm willing to pay you 5X. If the co-op that is offered in the MLS is 5X, then you will still get 5X, uh, but all 5X will be paid by uh, the listing side. Uh, if you bunch your buyer put in 5X there, that is the minimum, that is the floor of what you're walking out of this transaction for. Uh, there is no scenario in which you walk out of the transaction with a brokerage fee of less than 5X, unless you and the buyer have agreed to alter this agreement at, at a later date. And certainly, uh, if you are an associate licensee, that's a discussion you need to have with your broker in charge prior to doing. Now, what if instead uh, the co-op that was offered in the MLS is 7X? Uh, and by the way, when I'm saying MLS, this is an MLS that you are a participant in. Uh, if you were not an MLS participant, you are not going to be owed uh, that compensation that is offered in the MLS because that is an agreement between uh, those individuals that participate in the MLS. So the MLS that you're a participant in, uh, the co-op on the property is 7X. Again, now your compensation is going to be 7X. All that's going to be paid by the eight, by the listing side, um, but you still need to let your buyer know about it. Your buyer's going to have to consent to that uh, under Article 6 of the Code of Ethics. Now, what if instead uh, of 5X, the co-op in the MLS is 2X? 
Now, again, you're still going to walk out of the transaction with 5X as your brokerage fee. Um, but 2X is going to be paid by the listing side. And then your buyer is going to be responsible for paying the other three. 3X. If you, if you don't want your buyer to pay the 3X or your buyer doesn't want to pay the 3X, there are going to be two options for you. Uh, I'm going to let you know on the front end. One of these options is not going to be putting it in the sales contract. You should never have anything about your compensation in the sales contract between the buyer and the seller. Uh, unless it is already the pre-printed language we have in there. Do not add any verbiage to the contract about your commissions that is not appropriate. Um, so what are the two ways that you could uh, make sure your buyer doesn't pay uh, that remainder? Uh, the first would be before you even go submit an offer for the property, uh, do a separate compensation agreement using Form 120 between your brokerage and the listing brokerage, asking them to make up that difference. Uh, if that doesn't, if the seller listing side is not open to doing that or they don't want to do that, and your buyer still insists that they do not want to pay that remainder, uh, and you are fine with not them not paying the remainder, and you've talked to your broker in charge about it, then that's when you can make the pen and ink change uh, to the form here. And you know where you had 5X percent, you can scratch out 5X, put 2X, have both parties initial and dated. Again, as an agent, you should not be doing that without your broker in charge. Um, but if, you, if your buyer does not want to pay the difference, uh, even though that is what they contractually agreed to pay and make sure you're aware of, make them aware of that ahead of time. The only ways to cure that are either through that separate compensation agreement, Form 120 that is submitted and signed by both the brokerages prior to the offer being submitted or uh, through a pen and ink change by the buyer uh, and the agent uh, with the consent of their broker in charge. Or if your broker in charge signs these forms, then have the broker in charge initial and date it. Uh, but that is the only change that has been made uh, to this section. Uh, want to make sure that you're aware that that is not the only way that your compensation can be done as a as a brokerage. Uh, you also do have the ability through our agreement to do retainer fees or service fees or a combination of retainer fees, service fees, and, and brokerage fees. Um, and then, of course, uh, as a brief segue, in paragraph six of our sales contract uh, under transaction costs, it is understood that the buyer's, uh, whatever the buyer's brokerage fee is, is a buyer's transaction cost, and whatever the seller side uh, is theirs. Uh, so make sure if you're negotiating your contract that you're mindful of that. So the next form we will go to move on to is a form 370. So this is your buyer's occupy prior to closing uh, agreement. And now I'm going to let you know on the front end uh, that this form is certainly better than having nothing. Uh, it is absolutely better than tell, having a seller tell the buyer they left a key under the doormat. Um, but there, I'm going to also explain some better alternatives uh, to this. So we added in uh, the disclaimer at the top. You'll now see this form is really intended for a, a very short occupancy. Uh, this is for like seven days or less. Most commonly, a uh, buyer comes in on a Friday night, uh, wants somewhere to stay, start moving in their stuff. They're closing first thing Monday morning. Uh, this is not intended to be for uh, weeks or months. I always say this one, this form is for hours or days. And if they're going to do an hour or a day, or if they just need somewhere to stay the night before, I'd really recommend from a liability standpoint that they stay uh, at a hotel uh, instead. So, but this form certainly is available if you guys have it. If something's longer, longer is needed, uh, have the parties talk to their attorney. So why is the risk really associated with this form? Is the buyer, once the buyer takes possession of the property, they're liable for whatever happens with it. So uh, the most common example we get is the closing is not until Friday. Uh, the buyer decides on Wednesday today to take possession. And tonight, about midnight, the HVAC system uh, goes kaput. Even though the it's still the seller's property, the seller's not conveying the property into the buyer until Friday, under this agreement, uh, the buyer is going to be responsible for that repair because once the buyer crosses the threshold and takes possession, the seller's obligation is to make repairs on the property is over. So essentially, whatever property your buyer takes possession of is the property that they are getting. Um, that is not a change in this form. That's just I want to make sure that uh, you explain to your client what exactly they're agreeing uh, to. So what did we specifically change on here? Uh, we added a time that the occupancy occurred. Previously, we just had a date the occupancy would begin, um, but not a time. And we were getting calls on the hotline of people showing up at midnight, people showing up at you know 11 o'clock at night. So that hopefully uh, clears that up a little bit. Uh, as opposed to a per diem uh, payment, now all occupancies or occupancy fees are going to be paid in advance, uh, and the buyer will only receive possession of the property once or given or be able to occupy it once they have re 
pay their occupancy fee. So make sure that you are getting that occupancy up front uh, and the buyer's not receiving those keys until they pay the occupancy fee. Um, really, we did that. Want to make sure also paragraph five, it's not highlighted here, but this is a change. We had questions of what happens to the utilities. So we now have in there, who are the utilities going to be placed in for the time of the occupancy? And if it's, if you're deciding to switch them over to the buyer's name, the buyer's going to actually need to submit to you proof that they've done so prior to you giving them the keys uh, to the house. I will also note one of the issues with this with this form and, and this sort of arrangement is that it doesn't, it's not a landlord-tenant agreement. Um, so if the buy, if something falls through with the contract and now that you can't close, um, we have heard of difficulties of getting buyers out of the property uh, and same thing on the seller side. So just make sure your party's aware of that. They were working through all possible alternatives in this situation. Uh, talk to the closing attorney and see what works best. But we do have this form and the companion uh, seller form uh, should you need them. Um, but yes, otherwise just mostly switching it from any talk of rent to, to occupancy fees. So on the seller side, this is the this is sort of the companion form. This is what it, it looks like if the seller occupies after closing. Uh, we did change the name of the form to more closely mirror uh, the buyer form uh, 370. Again, the same disclaimers. This is for a very short period of time. It's not create a landlord tenant agreement. Uh, and then, of course, anything that's left in the house, if there's a fire casualty, uh, the seller is going to be responsible uh, for that. Again, we put a time period of which that seller gets to retain possession. Um, number two is an important ad addition. So especially if you're representing a buyer, you need to make sure that they're having discussions with their lender about this form and the intent for the parties to do this. Because depending on their loan product, there may be a time in which they need to take possession of the property. And if they have a seller that's staying in for a long period of time, that may interfere with the loan product they have and could cause uh, the transaction to fall through for having financing denied. So uh, again, this is really intended for a very short time period, you know, day, two days. Um, if there's something longer or anything at all, you certainly want to make sure you're talking to your lender uh, about this. Again, this fee is going to be paid in advance and possessions only essentially allowed uh, once the fee has been paid. If the parties have to extend it, that's going to need to be done through a separate uh, agreement. And then we you know, changed any reference to rent to, to occupancy fees. Again, just making sure parties are aware. So in the same scenario here, you close on Friday. The seller has asked, can I stay till the following Friday? Uh, the parties agree. And the following Wednesday after closing, the HVAC system goes kaput. Uh, the seller is going to be responsible for that repair. Um, because they are still in possession of the property. Uh, so make sure that the seller, you know, the seller is aware of that, the buyer is aware of what their obligations are, that they both parties have been advised to talk to counsel uh, prior, to, prior to signing these. And then if you're using the seller uh, Occupy after closing, that you've also looped in uh, the lender on that decision. So those are the three forms that we are editing. Uh, next, I'm going to go into two forms that are going to be completely new. Um, so we have never had these before in our form library. So the first is a Vacation Rental Act uh, addendum. So with this form and, and the next one we're going to talk about being an addendum, these are, not, these are not built into the contract. These are for you to use if they are applicable for your particular transaction. If they're not, then don't use them. Don't use them for a different purpose than they're intended. They are really narrowly tailored. Uh, for the what the contents of the form talk about. Uh, so this one is for you've got a property that is subject to a vacation rental. Uh, and I want to make sure that you're not just thinking of vacation rental as you know a, a beach house or a mountain house. This is anything that has an Air, you know, Airbnbs, VRBOs. Essentially, if there's a short-term tenant in the property uh, for 90 days after the deed is rat uh, recorded, uh, that has to be honored under statute. Uh, this is not this is not referring to long term tenancy long term tenants uh, long term tenancies. Uh, that's a completely separate issue. You actually need to make sure though you are addressing that um, because uh, paragraph four of our sales contract uh, does say that the seller is going to convey a vacant property. So that is in direct conflict uh, with um, if you have a tenant that has a year tenancy left. Uh, that's in, that's going to be in direct conflict with our contract. So you're going to need to talk to your attorney. But this is really again for those those short uh, tenants, vacation rentals uh, that have to be honored within 90 days. 
So what does this form do? The first thing is it actually lists out, we actually put in the entire rental act as it currently is in statute in, in this form. So the parties are fully aware of what their obligations are as both a buyer and as a seller uh, under, this, under this act. And then in the next page and a half, we sort of broke out the requirements from that statute into a series of questions that the parties are going to answer and they're going to initial next to uh, the applicable question. Uh, so some of the questions are, you know, have we actually received a list of all the vacation rentals because there's a requirement under statute that the buyers provided with those? Um, there's a question of, are there, is there a vacation rental management company associated with this property? Uh, if so, is the buyer going to keep them? If the buyer's not going to keep them, the seller needs to let the buyer you know, needs to let them know. Uh, if the buyer is keeping them, how are we going to get all the paperwork there? And then making sure that all the necessary pool passes and and codes and uh, it locks and essentially anything that somebody who's a vacation renter is going to need with the property that the seller is making sure they provide those to uh, to the buyer uh, there. So if this is something that you are if this is something that you deal with a lot. Uh, vacation rentals. Hopefully, this is going to be a nice, helpful uh, addendum. Uh, in the sales contract, we have that section that essentially a uh, paragraph that asks about attachments and contingencies. You would just want to list out here that there's a vacation rental uh, addendum attached to the contract and attach that to the contract. I will also give you a, a heads up that there are going to be some upcoming changes to the seller disclosure uh, that we hope to uh, announce for you guys in a short period of time. Um, but there are going to be some additional questions or, or rephrasing questions in regards to vacation rentals and including a checkbox of whether or not the property is subject to vacation rentals. Uh, so this will be a nice form to help you uh, work with those uh, inquiries. And then the last form that is brand new, uh, this one is one that we have received a request on for a number of years. And so I'm glad that we are finally able to bring this to you. Uh, we get calls all the time on the hotline of well, does this convey with the property? And so the easiest thing now we're going to have as a form is we have listed out A through Y of what conveys with the property. And so again, this being an addendum, this is not a required form. Uh, this is a form that the parties can use to try to rebut some of those, uh, those questions. Uh, otherwise, you're going to have to do those through separate bills of sales or uh, put it in paragraph three. But this really, um, the forms committee spent a, a good bit of time really examining what questions are they getting. Uh, we kind of compiled the list of questions that we got on the hotline and tried to make this as, as extensive as possible. So one way that I would suggest using this form, and I stole this from uh, members of the forms committee, is as a listing agent, show this form to your seller before they put their property on the MLS and say, we essentially have this form. This can alleviate a lot of these questions. Um, would you be fine with signing this form? And if you're, if you are, uh, but there's some of these items you would like to keep. Then we have in section two, where you can put what, which one of the items A through Y is not conveying. And then we can actually put this on the MLS listing. Uh, so when buyers are looking through the property, uh, they aren't falling in love with the bathroom mirrors or the uh, TV mounts or security cameras or any of those items because they know up front, hey, the seller does not intend uh, for you to have those. They want to take them with them. Um, and then ask any buyers who are submitting offers on your property uh, to submit this as part of their contract. So a couple of the big items that we get the questions most about, I'm sure you've all asked, uh, have been asked at some point, what about the video doorbells? What about the uh, cameras with the property? So under A, any of those are going to convey with the property unless otherwise noted. Uh, appliances. So this is built-in appliances. So I will note that uh, two two items that we get the questions about a lot that are not on here uh, because of their the nature of them are refrigerators and washers and dryers. Those are not considered built-in appliances unless it is one of these refrigerators that's built in to match the cabinets. Um, but if it's a refrigerator that can just be you know, pulled out and put on the moving truck or a washer and dryer, that is not going to be covered by this form. So you will need to note that in paragraph three or in a separate bill of sale. You know, any sort of mirrors, anything associated with, you know, swimming pools, water supply, uh, you know, smart thermostats. So this form does cover traditional versions of these products as well as uh, smart versions. And it also mentions that you have to include any accessories, dedicated equipment, remotes, anything that makes these work. So you can't take um, the, for example, you can't leave the chandelier, but take all the light bulbs. 
you got to leave all the light bulbs with it. Uh, if it's a ceiling fan that use with the, uses a remote control, you've got to leave the remote control. Any of the accessories that make your 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 pool work, uh, you got to keep those with there. So essentially, you have to leave the item, and you also have to make sure that the person who's purchasing the property can use it the same way that you used it. Uh, of course, any smart versions you're going to reset to factories uh, default settings, uh, and anything that you remove uh, because you noted in paragraph two, you are going to fix that damage. So that is all covered. Uh, on this form here. Uh, so hopefully this will be something that will be helpful for y'all. Again, this is not going to be built into the contract. So if these are items that are important to your client, uh, this is a separate addendum that you're going to need to attach to your offer. Uh, and then note in that same paragraph we discussed earlier uh, when, it talk, when we talked about the vacation rental. Uh, so that's just a, a brief kind of overview uh, of these forms. I know we've got a couple questions uh, as Nick noted, if you have any questions, I would encourage you to put them in the Q&A. Uh, we're not able to see raised hands or, or and being a webinar format, we're not having uh, the ability for anyone to, to sort of speak up. So if you have any questions, uh, you know, put them in the Q&A and we will try to get to, to them as best we can. If we do not get to your question today um, because of time, again, please shoot me an email, uh, austin at screaltours.org, and I'll be happy to answer uh, your question the best I can. Thank you, Austin. Um, so let's try to tackle a few of these questions. Um, and um, I wasn't sure uh, if uh, I should interrupt you, but you were on a uh, on a good roll there. Thank you for uh, your hard work and thank you for the hard work of the forms committee. It's a very difficult task to put together forms that um, uh, apply statewide and there'll always be some local you know, practices that uh, that will come into play. So um, going back, let's start from the beginning, Austin, the couple of the, the questions. There's a question um, regarding uh, the first form that you were reviewing. Um, uh, well, let me let me cover a couple of basic questions first. When will these forms be available for members to uh, to download? The as the goal is March twentieth. We are shooting for March twentieth. If it, if your form is not available on March twentieth, it will be in the it will be within spitting distance of March twentieth. Um, so they will be available on the SCR website on March twentieth, uh, and we are hoping that all the forms providers will have them on March twentieth. Great. Um, so the first form, uh, Jocelyn asks, uh, are we able or can we put X percent or more? Um, what are your thoughts on that? So, the, so there's no need to put or more um, because the contract already essentially states, again, if you put in 5x percent in your agreement and the co-op offered in the MLS is 7x, then your your compensation will be 7x unless you and the buyer uh, alter this agreement uh, through in a contingency in paragraph seven, 17. So uh, there's no need to put or more because if the compensation that's being offered by the other side is more, that automatically becomes uh, your compensation unless otherwise uh, written in the agreement. Patty asks, uh, will the closing attorney uh, collect at the closing? And if so, does the attorney need the, the, does the closing attorney need a copy of the buyer agency agreement? So I would, whether what the closing attorney uh, wants or needs for writing the particular closing statement, I'm going to defer um, to that particular closing attorney. Uh, anytime that closing, you know, the closing attorney is the drafter of the documents, so any questions about what they what they need or how they're going to do it uh, would really be uh, referred to them. I wouldn't want to speculate on what is going to be done on a, on a larger scale in the state. Okay. Um, Darcy asks, um, can they do a 390 addendum to change the commission percentage? Yeah, absolutely. So when I talk about doing a strike through, um, that's one way to do it. If your broker does not like you scratching through the contract or if your forms uh, software gives you difficulty when you do a strike through, um, where I talked about, you know, we had 5X here. Now your buyer doesn't want to pay the differential. And so you want to change it. You could either scratch that through initial and date it, or you could do a separate 390 that just takes this first sentence here, copy this sentence verbatim, Put this in a separate 390 and put in the new the new amounts. Uh, either way works. It just is your personal preference of whether you want strike threes or an addendum. Okay. John asks a question. It says he says um, the new language in the in form 130 
um, uh, basically states that the buyer is consenting to the, the higher uh, commission amount. Um, can you clarify what you meant about the buyer needing to provide uh, any additional consent? Yeah, so Article 6 of the, of the Code of Ethics uh, states that any compensation that the, agent, that the agent is receiving is done with essentially the consent of the client. Uh, so uh, you do have an obligation as a member of the association uh, being bound by the Code of Ethics uh, to have that discussion with your client. Uh, and your client needs to uh, consent to that under Article 6. And that, that also um, is important in light of uh, some of the other stuff going on around the country. Switching over to the occupancy uh, agreement, uh, Nikki asks, can the occupancy fee be zero, uh, zero dollars if the parties agree? Yes, I guess, in, in theory, yes, I guess it can be. Um, I... Certainly, the parties are intended to. I mean, it's it's a blank dollar amount. It, it can be zero. Um, that wouldn't be my recommendation necessarily. Um, but if that's what the parties want to do, and they're both aware of what this agreement does and doesn't do, and what their risks are, um, that's up to them to decide. Especially if they've discussed that with counsel. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you on that. There, the purpose of the forum is to provide some risk reduction, and you get you 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 eliminate the risk reduction by not having a fee there. Um, Rebecca asks, where does the occupancy fee go when collected? Does that go directly to the seller? Yes, so that that's gonna go to the parties. Again, with this being sort of an, uh, an add-on to, um, an add-on to the contract, uh, this would be something you again would want to consult the closing attorney with, and the closing attorney may have a way that they would like to have this handled. Uh, or they may want to make particular alterations to this. So uh, if 370 or 375 are going to be used in your particular transaction, uh, I would make sure that you're consulting with the closing attorney on that uh, and follow whatever guidance that they are, are giving. And that also gives a wonderful opportunity for both parties to get legal advice and a legal explanation of what the form is uh, under the agreement. Chris asks, and this is again on the occupancy agreement, Austin, um, what if they need seven more than seven days of occupancy? What do you what do you recommend? Uh, a regular lease agreement. So what they it depends on why they need how much more time they need and what they need it for. Uh, kind of we the the seven days was reached as a compromise amongst the forms committee. Uh, really, if it's something for a longer time period, that's really going to be something that needs to be drafted by counsel and be more, sort of more narrowly, narrowly tailored for the specific transaction of what the parties are intending. Um, so that would be uh, my recommendation is if they need something longer, uh, it's probably for a specific purpose and it's going to need something uh, more than a standard agreement can allow. Yeah, le legally, I, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, landlord-tenant law, uh, the exceptions in there would allow a situation like this to go beyond seven days, but as a business practice, uh, it can be it can it can trigger a lot of red flags. Um, and we were just seeing so many calls on the hotline of this being done for weeks and months, and then parties not understanding what they agreed to, and and things were going wrong with the property. And you know, we had a you know, especially on the buyer side, you let a buyer move in two weeks prior to closing. And then five days before closing, their financing falls through. And now you've essentially got a permissive squatter in the property. You, know, you have a seller who, who stays longer than they should um, after closing, or they stay, you, know, you let them stay in two, three months and you didn't notify the lender. Now the lender wants to do something about the loan. So really the seven days is there to tell you, hey, this is really intended for a very short time period. If the parties want to do something for more than a very brief time period, a, a week or less, they really need to be uh, engaging counsel to draft something uh, more specific. Okay. We have uh, a few more minutes here for a few more questions. Thank you. Uh, we've got a ton of folks. We've had over, six, <clears throat> excuse me, over six, over 700 realtors watching this live today. So thank you uh, for participating. Uh, Jim asks, um, do you prorate the property taxes to the occupancy day? Does that affect your any of your pro pro uh, rata items? So that's another great reason to talk to the to the closing attorney. Um, you know, their the adjustments and and things of prorating property taxes is covered in paragraph twenty two of the sales contract. Um, but especially maybe more on the on the back end. 
Uh, that may be a discussion point the parties need to have. And uh, for a particular transaction, that would defer that to, to the closing attorney. I uh, probably don't want to give some, some blanket answer in a, in a group setting. No, I understand. Uh, Paul asked a good question about, uh, at least an interesting question about how would a home warranty work if, uh, if uh, the buyer, uh, if the seller is in possession still of the property after the closing, that may be something more specific to look at your home warranty policy, right? Correct. And I mean, essentially the way these agreements work is uh, the the person who his name is on the deed. So if it's in the, this, you know, form 370, the seller, form 375, the buyer, um, the, they are required for having insurance on the actual structure itself. Um, but the sell, the occupant has to have insurance on their property uh, and against all the persons who are in there. So sort of uh, not a renter, you know, sort of all more akin to like a renter's insurance policy. Uh, how that would work with a particular home warranty, uh, that would be a question best directed to whoever the provider of that home warranty is. Um, but the key for both of these agreements is, is don't just sign these agreements and don't feel like you have to talk to anybody else about them. Um, those are, you know, lender, closing attorney, a uh, home warranty company, your insurance um, providers, things of that sort need to all need to be included in these conversations. And again, if this is really just going to be for a day or two days, um, again, I would, I would refer them probably to a, to a hotel just from a risk management standpoint. Jim sends a, a good reminder that um, uh, many above ground propane tanks are actually leased and not owned by the, the owner. So that's something important to keep in mind. And um, I do want to note in here in paragraph two of the personal property addendum, <clears throat> when it talks about properties that will items that will not convey, that's where you would put in anything that is leased uh, or not owned by the seller. So if you have a, a an item that is leased, uh, that would be a great time to note that you would also want to probably make that disclosure on the seller's disclosure. Yeah, the um, another Jim also points out this is a good suggestion, Jim, for a future update to the forms, but he says that personal property should uh, have lines to write in brands, models, serial numbers, et cetera. Um, I can imagine that kind of a form would get pretty lengthy with those uh, additional descriptions, but there's certainly no reason why the parties can't provide that information if, if uh, requested. Um, yeah, so if you're not using this form and you're talking about more specifically the refrigerator, washer and dryer, we absolutely on the hotline recommend you don't just put refrigerator, washer, and dryer because you won't. You, so a lot of times you won't be happy with which one is left for you. So in that case, we do recommend you know put a two door, French door, uh, you know stainless steel, you know whatever color it is. Um, you know, open up the door, model number, uh, that type of stuff. You know, at least for this form, it talks about anything that was present on the date of it. Uh, maybe as if you want to be extra cautious as a buyer's agent. Um, send a nice email to the seller that goes, you know, we wanted to make note that these are the items we found, we saw on the property on the state. Was there anything that we were missing? Uh, and at least then you have something uh, as a, as a legal, as a written document to sort of help your case. Um, but the yeah. intent of this form is if it's present on the property uh, on this date and it's not excluded in paragraph two, it's conveying with the property. Yeah. Michael points out how, you know, you can't, you can't get into a argument over a serial number. It, it, it either matches or it doesn't. Right. Um, Lee, uh, let's see. Um, a question uh, from an anonymous attendee. What if the seller decides they want to keep something uh, uh, because the, the, the offer is uh, below list price would, would they have to commit to it since it was, already listed in the MLS, obviously that would be something that could be negotiated between the parties prior to final contract, right, Austin? Correct. So when I was talking about putting this in the MLS, you were kind of giving a, a heads up to the buyer of items you would like to keep. Um, if it depends on the particular offer, you want to adjust it. If it if this addendum, as it's written, is not attached to the contract, it has no force or effect. So if your particular seller wants to keep items, and maybe that's varying based on the purchase price, they're going to be bound by whatever is put attached to the contract that is that everyone's operating under. They're not going to be bound by what's put in the MLS, which is also a nice reminder to you. Just because the MLS says that a washer and dryer or a refrigerator is conveying, if that does not make it to paragraph three of the sales contract or to a separate bill of sale and the buyer changes and the seller changes their mind and puts them on the moving truck, uh, you have no recourse 
um, because it does not make it to the agreement. Uh, the entire binding clause that's in our sales contract says that anything that does not make the four corners of this document, uh, describe, whether it was in a uh, other agreement, whether you texted about it, emailed, talked about it over the phone, does not have any binding effect on the parties. You know, that piggybacks on to Kim's question. She says, if you list appliances in the contract, will that cover washer, dryer, and refrigerator? Well, uh, you really are creating some potential risk there if you just simply use that word, aren't you? Correct. I would give as much detail as possible. Again, you know, refri you know refrigerator, you know, describe the refrigerator, model number, yeah, serial number, really make it impossible to, to back out. If you say, you know, all appliances, then, oh, we didn't think you meant this one or, or that one. So uh, give as much detail as possible. Um, you know, again, if you use this form, you're going to be covered on all built-in appliances. The only thing you would need to do separately would be washers, dryers, uh, refrigerators, uh, or anything else that's not considered built-in. Dorothy asks uh, a good question. Is there a reason that solar panels aren't on the list? Uh, those, I believe, are covered under paragraph three. Um, we also, I think, did have, uh, those are, I think there's something in here about uh, electrical type stuff. Uh, we have gotten that question, but generally those are handled uh, under paragraph three. Uh, I think it specifically are mentioned in paragraph three of the contract. So solar panels are already mentioned in your sales contract. Okay, great. Um, let's see, we've got, a few, uh, we've got a bunch of questions. I'm doing our best to get through them. Uh, just a reminder, the forums will be available on March 20th. Uh, I know several requests if they can get them early, but in, for the sake of consistency, we will have these out on March 20th available on our website. So they are available in draft version currently on our website. So if you go to screaltors.org backslash forms, there's a link in about the middle of the page that says click here to view draft versions of the form. And those are currently available. But yes, the unwell remarked uh, unhighlighted versions will not be available until March the 20th. Uh, Joel makes a comment that in, in another state that uh, uh, the form is included in the purchase agreement. Um, and why is it in a separate form? But I think you've, you've, you've discussed that at a, at, at a good length and, and it may end up one day, Joel, in, in the, uh, in the uh, purchase agreement itself, but as it stands today, that's that's the first steps we're taking uh, with it. There are also several questions about security systems and things that um, uh, can be either leased or or can be easily removed. Those are things to to keep in mind as as well. Even now, the I don't know how many of you have these uh, iPhone or or Bluetooth enabled smart locks, and uh, and I can envision people taking those. Uh, with them as well when uh, they leave. So those are all things to keep. Uh, Which if you use this form, if it was present on the date of the offer, that conveys. And just, just a, as a reminder, the forms will be available online and in zip forms and our other form libraries on March 20th. We're getting several uh, questions about that. Um, um, Austin, can you remind us what is the form number for the personal property? When I, I'm actually, that's all my list of things to do today is assign it a number. So oh, I don't we don't have numbers yet. That, well, that's another reason why we don't have them out. Cool. Yeah. So, um, same thing with the vacation rental form. So is it a safe guess to say it will be a three digit number? It will absolutely be a three digit <laughs> number. <laughs> I'm guessing I'm I'm guessing that these will start with either a three or a five. Yeah, and 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 we've got several questions where they you know like one about uh, pool equipment. Does it include you know specific items, covers, heating elements? Uh, uh, would hurricane shutters or or add-on safety equipment? Um, you know, if you know that these are elements that that the parties have expressed interest in conveying. Then, then you need to be specific uh, about those additional items, right? Correct. Right. Yes. Yeah. So, and that's, you can always put it in here, you know, make sure it's in here. If you want to be extra careful, uh, you can have that listed in paragraph three. Um, you know, speaking to the swimming pool, I mean, that's, that is here. Uh, any maintenance, heating, and filtration equipment. Uh, we, of course, also have, you know, up here uh, that there is, 
any of the items above include any necessary accessories, dedicated equipment. So something like a pool cover, uh, wood, uh, I would think would convey uh, based on this. Uh, and then the hurricane shutters, uh, you know, we have any windows, window screens, um, that type of stuff. If you if you don't if you're not sure whether or not that would cover your hurricane shutters, then certainly I would you know uh, amend the contract through paragraph three to say hurricane shutters. So Katie asked a question about um, uh, the Vacation Rental Act. She says, does a, a new buyer have to honor on-site rental management uh, if there are no existing rentals for that 90-day period after purchase? And the short answer is no, right? Correct. They and do not. The state law only applies to um, protect the tenant, those tenants that are coming right. in. Yeah, they don't want someone who, who who saved up has already bought airfare to fly down here um, to go to the beach for a week in, in July and you happen to sell the property the first week of June and then you have to say, hey, you can't come down here. Um, so those are why they have to be honored within an, within 90 days. So the booking is you know 180 days out from, from the time the deed's recorded and those do not have to be honored. They can be, uh, but the only ones that are statutorily required to be honored are within 90 days of uh, a closing or deed recording. Okay. Um, let's see, uh, we're getting close to the end of our time. Again, lots of questions about form numbers and release dates. Again, March 20th, they'll be available online and, and to all of our vendors. Um, uh, one, Michael asks, is there uh, any advice we we'll give on the hotline regarding solar pan panels, Austin? Is there a best practice on how we deal with those. I know sometimes a sale can trigger the, 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 the clawback clause on those, those lease agreements, right? Yeah. So, so I mean, solar panels, if you notice those when you're going to see a property, um, the, the best advice we give is you need to address that sooner rather than later. Um, get any and all necessary, you know, related documents. Again, that's another time to make sure you, you loop, loop in the closing attorney, make sure that's not going to trigger something in, in the lease, uh, or, or, you know, loan of them. Um, you know, make sure that the, you know, as a seller, make sure that those are disclosed on the seller disclosure. Um, yeah, really. But that's something if the parties have, they need to get, they need to have that discussion early on. That's not something to wait until the week of closing to, to say, hey, maybe we need to discuss these solar panels. Okay. Um, let's see. We're not going to have enough time. We've got a bunch of other questions. Uh, let me uh, I'll, I'll close out by just letting everybody know that um, uh, this, this video webinar will be, it has been recorded, it will be presented and shared on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash SC Realtors. Uh, you can reach Austin. If we didn't get to your question today, please email Austin directly at austin at screaltors.org. Um, and of course, the legal hotline at SCR can be reached at 803-772-5201. Uh, um, and uh, email, I think, will be the quickest and, and best response. So Austin, I'll let you uh, close it out with any final, any, any final comments. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Uh, thank you again to the Forms Committee um, for their work on on all these forms. This was the work of the, the 2022 uh, forms committee. So if you know any of those folks, uh, you know, thank them for their for their time and effort to this on these forms. Uh, and again, reach out to me if you have any any questions, uh, you know, try to allow uh, at least, maybe, you know, 24 hours for a response. But I promise if you email me, uh, you I will respond back to you with uh, an answer the best I can. And uh, if we can ever be, be of any help, please let us know. Thank you, everyone. Have a great week, and we'll be back with more legal content here soon. Make sure you check out our new legal podcast and uh, all the great uh, informational work that we're doing at SCR. And if you have not checked out our newest member service, Forewarn, please uh, go to our website and learn more about this new safety app we've, we've rolled out. Everybody have a great week. Thank you.